Hear the words from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, the 21st verse. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. This is our text. So let me ask you, can you think your way to God? Now think in a moment. Think about that for a moment. Yes, I'm asking you to think about thinking your way to God. Well, this might be an abstract co- question that perhaps ought to be left to the college students. I think there is some truth and wisdom here, even for those who are looking for the simple life. Even for those who would rather avoid people, even they can benefit from this question. After all, not only do they still have to deal with people, they are a people themselves. Can you think your way to God? I can see how you might argue, well, if you are thinking, then you must be living. As Rene Descartes once said, I think, therefore I am. But as people are moving around, living their life, making friends or avoiding people, just doing something, are they stepping back and saying, there must be a God who is Lord over all creation? Many times in philosophy, the people learn and believe by examining the world before them. Oftentimes, this is known as the Aristotle approach. Aristotle was one of the Greek philosophers that lived before the time of Jesus. The opposite approach to Aristotle is Plato. The Plato approach. Plato is another Greek philosopher. He believed that the world and what it is today is to be known through just understanding what the ideal forms are truly are. And what we see today are just the imperfect forms of what things are supposed to be perfect. So this world is filled with imperfect plants, imperfect animals, and imperfect people. But then you have to ask the question, well then how do you know just what the perfect person is? If everything is imperfect, how do you know what perfect is? And many times this can be answered by taking the average of what we experience in the world. If you collect information about plants, animals, people, then you should be able to get a good idea of what a plant ought to be, what an animal or a person ought to be. Now notice here that by taking the average of what we experience, it's pretty much the scientific way of understanding the world we live in. And this scientific approach is what drives our recent centuries today. Rather than turning to philosophers or clergy for answers today, many times people are turning to science. And there are definitely many things we can enjoy from this approach. The health that we have today, the food, the medicine, the technology. Which is just fine. It's okay to use science to better understand the world we live in. But then going back to my first question. Can we think our way to God. 
Can we... Where do we see God in our world today? Do we even think about God to enjoy life? Does God even need to fit in the picture? Many universities haven't found God to be of any help in their education system. The schools that were often created by Christians or perhaps even the church organizations have reasoned God out of their schools. It doesn't fit. And why is that? When you heard the Ten Commandments today, what did you think of them? Did you like them? Did you think they were fair? Did you think they were outdated? Especially when it talked about the neighbor's ox. Long-time Christians would, of course, say, of course it's fair. But I know, and I'm guessing that you know, that there are many so-called educated experts that would try to give reasons why the Ten Commandments aren't good for the people to follow. So might argue, my, why honor what parents want for their children? For the state knows what's best for both. Why have someone live another day if the person themselves would, doesn't want to? Why stay faithful to your spouse if your spouse is not making you happy? Because that's the wisdom people are following today, isn't it? Do whatever makes you happy. This life is all you got, and this all you need to be responsible for is you. Another idea of being sold is to always be yourself, or always be true to yourself. After all, no one likes a hypocrite, right? But what does Scripture say? Scripture says in Proverbs 19, verse 1, Better is a poor person who walks in the way of his integrity than one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. So in other words, yes, hypocrisy is bad. But Scripture also tells us in Psalm Chapter 51, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So we are all born imperfect, and we are all born with a corrupted heart and mind. As it is also written in Romans 3, No one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless, and no one does good, not even one. And then shortly later, Paul says that the law is great at revealing our sin. It's great at showing us how we are imperfect. So I can see why people try to reject God's law. The law is great at telling them that they are wrong. Scripture would even go as far as to say as they were born wrong. And no one likes to be told they are wrong. But yet people do need to be corrected to know what is right. You need to be corrected and I need to be corrected. What about the people being corrected in our gospel lesson? What do you think about how Jesus reacted and how he overturned the tables? Jesus said, do not make my father's house a house of trade. 
Jesus was upset. It appears that though the temple business was thought to be pleasing to the Lord, Jesus says it was not. Perhaps the part of the people were more focused on receiving a good income that day rather than worshiping the Lord and living with repentant hearts. As Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. So yes, the people were selling things that had a right and so that the people could have the right and proper animals they need to make a proper sacrifice to the Lord. But apparently they weren't doing it in a God-pleasing way. And, and God does get upset when we sin. But greater than his wrath is his love and mercy and forgiveness. The Jews in the temple want to know by what purpose he has for doing these things. Why is Jesus in the right for making a mess in the temple on this Jewish holiday? What signs will Jesus give to prove his position? And Jesus replied, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. It appears that Jesus didn't have further discussion about this comment, for even his own disciples at the time didn't know what he was talking about. Jesus himself is the temple that he was speaking about. The sign he gave them is a sign from the future, his own death and resurrection. The truth that many have been looking for was standing right in front of them. He was speaking to them. For the people, the truth didn't need to be conceptualized it didn't need to be understood through countless hours of studying in an ivory tower, looking down and observing the people. God revealed wisdom and truth to the life and the death of his own son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, God in the flesh, gave the truth to everyone. He gave it to the rich. He gave it to the poor. He gave it to the educated and the uneducated. He gave it to the chosen race of the Jews, the people from the people of whom God promised a savior. And he even gave it to those who were not of the chosen race. The Gentiles. That would be you and me. We also may benefit from the promises that were given to the Jews. And the promises that all, and God also promises that all who believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The fact that God saves anyone who asks to be rescued is just an unfathomable topic for many people. When we look at how the world works and compare it to what God says and his instruction, many times people will say, but that's not how the real world works. It doesn't make any sense. People need to earn their way to get anything, to receive or benefit from anything. In the real world, justice ought to be served. There ought to be punishment for people not keeping their word. This goes for strangers, friends, and those in high positions. 
there ought to be punishment for those who are oppressing others, even those from work, families, or even the government. And one person might even ask, who has the right to use a particular race as lab rats? Perhaps even the whole population of the world. But Jesus is different. Jesus is so abundant in love and power, and he sees all this suffering oppression And so he comes to this earth, the one to suffer and be oppressed and to die for the sake of the people of the world. That the people, that the judgment that the people so desire can be placed upon him. So that the punishment of sin, that which is death, can be defeated. For all have, for all who have and will believe in him will be saved. And where do you hear this good news? It's not by looking at a sunset. It's not by examining the typical habits of people. It may not even be looking at the church. For we too are sinners, as Romans had just said, and we too fail to love like Jesus. You don't hear the good news of Jesus by thinking up of a perfect empire for people to live in. Intelligent or not, we all struggle at finding right and wrong. We still all struggle at figuring out What is the love, loving thing to do? No matter how intelligent we are, we all still have to deal with death. Death will defeat us all. But Jesus died for us all so that we may be victorious over death like he was that we may rise from the grave like when Jesus did. And he will do this when Jesus returns a second time. Jesus will come back and restore this world to the perfect state that it was originally created in. A state that cannot be tested today by an averaging of sums but a state that goes back to the time of Adam and Eve. So if Jesus defeated death for you and for me, let us believe in Jesus. In Jesus who died for our sins, knowing that we are forgiven in him, and that through Jesus we are saved. God continues to reveal himself today through his word, through his sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion. And we have the cross to remind us that Jesus truly did suffer and die for us 2,000 years ago. And we are his baptized children of God, where we are made his temple to believe in the living God who once died for us on the cross, who fills us with his righteousness, through, through Jesus' perfect blood that was shed for us, we are made in the right and we are redeemed. And as God's children, he sends us his Holy Spirit to be led in sanctification, to be led to do the good and God-pleasing works that God wants us to do. Even lead us to forgive others so that others may hear and believe and be saved by the good news of Jesus Christ, who was crucified. And so because of everything God has done for us, as Paul says, let us boast in the Lord. All that we have is a gift from him.
even the wisdom of knowing what is truly right and good and everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, we will now collect our